Okay, so um, pretty much I will be talking about the same stuff that uh, Paul was talking, but I will try to uh, approach it from a philosophical perspective. And I think we agree on most stuff. We may disagree on some details, but um, yeah, if we talk about more, we'll, we'll make up our minds. Um, um, what I'm going to do, first of all, is that I will uh, explain how I think about group knowledge, a little bit about extended and distributed cognition, um, so that I can then explain what is the specific sense of group knowledge that I have in my mind. And then I will try to give you an example of how it can be put in practice by seeing how we can solve a problem uh, that Wikipedia is currently facing. By the way, some of you may have seen this talk before, so today I will be giving an extended version of this talk. And anecdotally, last time I tried to give this extended version, it was here in the, so in the informatics forum in front of informaticians who didn't allow me to finish the talk because for every single slide I had, they would interrupt me. So I hope you will behave and you will let me finish and then you can ask questions. Um, Okay, so I'm interested in general in the idea of group knowledge and specifically whether groups can acquire knowledge in the same way that individuals do. Uh, so I'm not interested as group in group knowledge as being the sum total of the knowledge possessed by uh, the individual members of the group, but instead as knowledge produced uh, by a group as a whole. So I'm not interested in the idea of group beliefs I'm interested in the idea of collectively produced knowledge. Uh, this is how I approach group knowledge. I don't, I don't care about the literature in, in, in collective beliefs or um, accepting beliefs. So the starting point is the extended cognition and the distributed cognition hypothesis. The first one says that when we interact with the device, then we can say that the cognitive system extends to the device. Uh, the distributed cognition hypothesis says whenever we interact with other agents, then we might say that the cognitive system is distributed um, uh, across all these agents. And there are several ways that we can approach those two hypotheses and make sense of them. One of them being common sense functionalism. Uh, but I think that the best way to do so and the most informative way to make sense of those two hypotheses is on the basis of dynamical systems theory which is the kind of mathematics that Newton introduced in order to account for his mechanics and which is used all over the physical sciences. And the reason why I think that dynamical systems theory is very helpful is because, uh, according to it, if we want to say that uh, several distinct parts give rise to an overall system that consists of all of them at the same time, which is presumably what we are saying in the case of extended and distributed cognition, then what we need to do is to make sure that all these distinct components are non-linearly related with each other on the basis of mutual interactions. And the reason why these mutual interactions and non-linear relations are important to make the argument is because uh, such relations, they give rise to new systemic properties that do not belong to any of the underlying subcomponents instead to their ongoing interaction. And so if we want to make sense of these properties and attribute them to somewhere, then we have to take into consideration the overall component, the overall system. And then the second reason is that they also make it impossible to decompose the overall system um, in terms of distinct inputs and outputs from the one component to the other, the reason being that the way each component behaves is simultaneously dependent on the behavior of the other components. And so if we want to make sense why each component behaves the way that it does, then we will have to take into account the overall system. So this is how I'm thinking about extending a distributed cognition. It is both necessary and sufficient to have such uh, non-linear relations on the basis of mutual interactions. And to see how this uh, is going to be applied in practice, what it means with respect to extended cognition is that we cannot go on and claim that our minds may extend or that our memories may extend on the basis of phone books and directory services in the sense that we can know the phone numbers of everyone whose number is listed. The reason being that in such cases, when we employ these artifacts, the dependence is only one way. We just retrieve the information from the artifact. We don't mutually interact with it, and so it won't count as a case of cognitive extension. 
and neither will uh, shopping lists, because even though we do create them ourselves for some uh, use at later stage, uh, crucially, at the time of retrieval, we don't mutually interact with it, and so it won't count as a case of cognitive extension. There are, however, other cases that will qualify, and my favorite one is tactile visual substitution systems, which is a pair of sunglasses that have attached to them a mini video camera that converts the visual input into tactile stimulation under the agent's tongue. And the agent, by moving around, he, he affects the kind of input he will receive from the device. And in this way, he gets to perceive shapes and objects in space and orient themselves in space. And of course, similar stuff can also be said about the much lower tech case of the blind person and his cane. Microscopes, telescopes. Um, there is also another very interesting case, which is the case of the magnetic band, uh, where subjects can use it and move around and perceive the direction of the magnetic north as vibrations around the waist. And what is very uh, interesting about this case is that after a while, the subjects start reporting that they can actually perceive magnetic north as a distinct object that is out there in the same way that we perceive the objects of our visual perception, not just as stimulation in our retinas, but as objects that are out there. Um, and I think that mutual interactions also take place in the case of Google Glasses. Um, not always when we use our laptops, but on several occasions uh, when we solve problems with pen and paper. And so uh, all these are cases that will qualify as cases of cognitive extension on the basis of the mutual interactions criterion. And then when it comes to uh, distributed cognition, um, we won't be able to say that whenever we ask for directions from a stranger, we have a case of distributed cognition, exactly because in such cases there are no mutual interactions. We just ask for some uh, information, we receive the information, and that's the whole uh, story. And the same goes in cases of testimony in the court of law. But there are other cases that will qualify as cases of distributed cognition. And so we have cases of brainstorming, scientific research teams, and of course, for several types of swarm intelligence, uh, which is where the idea of distributed cognition originates from. Now, to see how this is related to the idea of knowledge, um, the connecting point has to do with the classical account uh, of justified true belief, and specifically with the problem with the justification component. Because so far, everyone has been thinking about justification, or not everyone, but most epistemologists have been thinking about justification as some kind of ability to provide explicit reasons in favor of our beliefs. Um, but there is this problem that there are so many beliefs that count as knowledge and which are produced on the basis of processes that no one really knows how they work or why they are reliable. So to give you examples, think about visual perception or memory, which are processes that deliver knowledge, but not, no one, not even scientists, know exactly how they work, but still we would like to say that they're good justification sources. So that's a problem. Um, but recently, it has been suggested that perhaps the way to solve this problem is to think about justification in terms of cognitive integration, um, which, just as in the case of philosophy of mind and cognitive science, is supposed to be thought as a function of cooperation and interaction, or cooperative interaction with other aspects of the agent's cognitive system. And the way cognitive integration is supposed to solve the problem that I mentioned just before is that if a process is cognitively integrated in this way, then it can be continuously monitored in the background by the rest of the agent's cognitive system, such that if there is a problem with it, then the agent will be able to spot it and respond appropriately. Otherwise, if there is no problem, then the agent can go on and be by default justified in employing the relevant process, uh, even if he cannot offer any positive explicit reasons in its support. So this is how uh, thinking about justification in terms of cognitive integration solves the problem that I mentioned. But uh, what is interesting with respect to group knowledge is that if this is how we should be thinking about justification, 
Um, then it does seem that we cannot go on and claim that justification can be distributed across several individuals, provided that those individuals give rise to a distributed cognitive system on the basis of mutual interactions. So in other words, if mutual interactions is what is required in order for something to count as both epistemically and cognitively integrated, then it does seem that we can go on and claim that there can be epistemic group agents that can give rise to group knowledge in the sense that the justification is a collective process and not just a process that goes on within the individual's heads. Now, to give you some examples, uh, several philosophers and ethnographers of science have suggested that on several occasions, if we really want to understand the knowledge produced by scientific research teams, then uh, we should try and analyze that knowledge in terms of distributed cognition and something very similar to what I have been calling group knowledge. And then a very uh, interesting example from cognitive psychology that Heather Batterley mentioned yesterday in her talk is the case of transactive memory systems, which are supposed to be um, groups of two or more individuals that collaboratively store, encode, and retrieve information. And the typical example is about an old couple where we ask them where did they get a souvenir from, and one partner says that it must have been more than 20 years ago, and then the other partner says it must have been in Northern Europe, then the other partner says anything else, and so on and so forth, until one of them or as it happens on several times, uh, both of them at the same time make the final recollection. And the idea is that on the basis of these transactive communication processes, they manage to recall something that uh, none of them could have recalled were they trying to remember on their own. And so Wegner and his colleagues at Harvard uh, claim that in such cases, we have a knowledge acquiring, knowledge holding, knowledge using system that is greater than the sum of its under individual member systems. And so it does seem that it can qualify as the kind of system that can give rise to group knowledge. Now, apart from just being very interesting examples on their own, um, the reason why I focus on these two specific examples is that in both cases, uh, it has been suggested that what is practically required in order to have a well-integrated distributed system is that first of all, every individual involved possesses some kind of common knowledge that will allow them to communicate uh, with each other and so start a relationship even as strangers, but at least having a sense that each knows something that the other individuals know, which will then allow them to take the second step, which is to grow the differentiated structure of the community by revealing information about themselves and so getting an, a sense of who the other individuals are such that they will know when it is time for them to rely on the knowledge and expertise of the other individuals and when it is time for them to take action themselves, which will finally allow them to take the third step, which is to start and interact mutually with each other and which according to dynamical systems theory, I believe, is the only necessary and sufficient condition in order to have a well-integrated distributed system. So, interesting examples on their own right, but they also make clear what is practically required in order to have a distributed system. Uh, but I think that the most interesting example comes from web science, and before I start talking about social machines, uh, I also want to note that uh, the web itself started as a knowledge management system for CERN, which was designed to allow uh, scientists to communicate with each other. And as its creator Berners-Lee explains in his book, despite the fact that the web has expanded widely over the last 25 years, so far uh, it still has quite some way to go until it achieves its final goal, which is to become an intimate collaborative medium. And Berners-Lee explains in several passages in his book that this is because so far the web has been designed in order to allow lots of people to access information that just a few uh, users post online, whereas what we need to do is to redesign it so that uh, users can post information just as easily as they can access, them, access it, so that they can both affect and be affected by the web in a mutual way. And the reason why this is important, Berners-Lee says, is that when we achieve this, then actually we will have managed 
to create social machines, which he defines, as we saw before, as web-driven processes in which the people do the creative work and the machine does the administration, and which will enable us to do things we just couldn't do before. Specifically, he says, high-level activities such as knowledge, uh, intuition, imagination, which have occurred just within one's human's brain, will occur among even larger, more interconnected groups of people acting as if they shared a larger intuitive brain. And so again, they do seem to be the kind of um, systems that can give rise to group knowledge. Now, you might think that, although talking just after Paul, you probably think that there are lots of social machines. Um, this might be the point that we disagree. I might think that there are not so many out there um, yet. Uh, but wikis have been very successful in helping building such social machines, exactly because they allow the creation of content in a collaborative way. And so it's not surprising that at least the most successful social machine is the case of Wikipedia, which according to a recent study uh, between 2004 and 2007 had a huge success with an exponential growth of its active contributors, which are the contributors that didn't edit Wikipedia once, but instead after the first time they kept coming back. Now, apart from just being a very a famous and successful case of a social machine. The reason why I want to focus on it is because ever since uh, Wikipedia has been experiencing a worrisome uh, problem, which is that there is a steady decline in the number of these active contributors, which are also supposed to be the driving force of Wikipedia. And as the rest of the study that I'm focusing on uh, indicates, this is not because other studies show that this is not because there is a decline in the number of um, existing contributors, and neither is it uh, because of a decline in the number of newcomers, which uh, ever since 2006 has been steady. Instead, it seems to be because of a decline of, in the number of surviving newcomers, um, which got out of Wikipedia uh, not because uh, something went wrong with the entries or because they didn't want to keep um, editing Wikipedia, but instead because the entries got reverted by automated and semi-automated bots and machines. So in other words, what happened is that around 2006, in order for Wikipedia to keep the quality of its content high, Despite, and exactly because there was a, 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 an exponential growth, it introduced some semi-automated and automated bots and machines that would, allow, that would help it to uh, um, prevent itself from being vandalized. Uh, and the irony is that even though those semi-automated and automated bots and machines did help Wikipedia against vandalism, they're also the reason why now there is a steady decline in the number of the active contributors. The reason being that newcomers did not appreciate it, having their entries rejected by those automated bots and machines without explaining to them what went wrong with their entries. And so they felt like they lost the time and they never came back to become active contributors. So one question is um, whether Wikipedia could have actually prevented this problem from happening. And if we want to be very strict about it, we might say that yes, because as Berners-Lee explains in his definition of Wikipedia, the machine aspect of the machine is only supposed to be doing the administrative work, whereas um, the creative tasks are supposed to be done by the human aspects of the social machine, and quite obviously deciding which entries must stay and which entries must go is a very creative task to perform. So to solve this problem, uh, obviously Wikipedia must find a way to allow its active contributors to interact with each other in a meaningful way, such that they can keep the quality of the uh, content high without the use of automated bots. And the way to do so is to allow uh, all these active contributors to efficiently interact with each other. 
And there might be several ways that Wikipedia can do that, but I think that it can use some general guidelines and specifically try to implement the two properties that I mentioned before are uh, practically necessary if we want to have a well-integrated social machine. And uh, again, there might be several ways that Wikipedia can do that, but to give you an example, uh, what it can do is that, first of all, it can ask every new contributor to also register some area of expertise that then Wikipedia can uh, use in order to more efficiently allocate the workload of editing uh, the new entries by sending notifications of a new entry only to those contributors who possess the relevant expertise. And at the same time, Wikipedia can also keep monitoring how many entries a given contributors and how many edits a given contributor's entries undergo over time, and if it is too many of them, then recall that uh, contributor's status of expertise on the relevant problematic domain. And if Wikipedia manages to do so, then not only will it have managed to allow the right contributors to meaningfully interact with each other, but it would also have managed, as the circle indicates, to self-regulate uh, by allowing the right contributors to monitor each other and affect the kind of notifications that we receive from Wikipedia, such that every time there is a mistake or a falsehood posted online, it will be very quickly spotted and removed, which is very similar to the way that we get justified within our own heads. So that's a problem, and that's how I think thinking about group knowledge and distributed cognition uh, can solve this problem for Wikipedia. Uh, but before I draw some general concluding remarks, I think it's also interesting pointing out that there might in fact be a problem with solving the problem for Wikipedia. The reason being that um, even though this might be an interesting solution to the problem. I don't think it's, it's, it's a brilliant solution. It's something that uh, contributors of Wikipedia could have uh, suggested in a pre-theoretical, intuitive way on their own. But even if they had, and probably such a solution would be suggested by newcomers, because this is a problem for newcomers, uh, still such a solution wouldn't have been implemented. The reason being that uh, even though Wikipedia while well, it was growing, it operated on the basis of some kind of decentralized governance. Around 2005, it introduced a very structured process for suggesting new norms. And this uh, structured process had the effect, first of all, of increasing the rate of rejecting newcomer suggestions. Um, it gave more power to senior editors of how new suggestions uh, are going to be interpreted. And overall, it led to a decrease in the introduction of new norms, especially by newcomers. And as I mentioned, such a solution as the one I suggested would be introduced by newcomers. And this overall tendency towards a more centralized governance on the basis of senior contributors is actually very worrying. Because the reason why distributed cognitive systems are very successful is exactly because they can be very adaptive to new changes in their environment and their own evolving needs. And in order for this to happen, they must operate on the basis of some kind of decentralized governance. So in other words, there is no specific way or recipe that Wikipedia uh, has to be at any given time. Instead, just like any living organism, Wikipedia must evolve and adapt to new changes. And this is why it, ha it must have a decentralized structure. So overall, uh, going back to the general concept of social machines, uh, it is interesting to ask how are we going to define social machines? Uh, because even though um, Berners-Lee initial suggestion is uh, perhaps wrong, uh, but certainly quite vague. Um, recently, Paul Smart and Nigel Sadbold, they suggested that an improved way of thinking about social machines is to say that they're web-based socio-technical systems in which the human and technological elements play the role of participant machinery with respect to the mechanistic realization of system-level processes. Now, of course, this is a much improved version, but still I think you might think that it's a little bit vague because it's not very easy to understand what is supposed to be participant machinery and what a system level process is. 
But what I want to suggest is that now, on the basis of dynamical systems theory, we can go ahead and say that system level processes are processes of integrated systems that arise out of the mutually interacting components, uh, which is what a participant machinery is supposed to be. And then, uh, having this in mind, I think that we can go on and compare the idea of social machines with um, the rest of the available social computing software on the basis of what Ed C calls the social web collaboration spectrum. And what we can do is to say that on the left-hand side of the spectrum, oh no, yeah, left, okay. The left-hand side of the spectrum, um, where we have lightweight, lightweight collaboration, such as Dig, Reddit, and Delicious. The reason why these are not social machines, but uh, simply what we may call crowdsourcing, is because in such cases, even though the users can contribute to, to, to the software, they can only contribute in an active way by some kind of voting and perhaps clicking a like button. Um, then in the middle, we have what we might call collective information structures, um, such as YouTube, Flickr, Facebook, and so on, which uh, differs to crowdsourcing because in this case, um, the users can actively contribute, not just by voting, but by posting content themselves. However, still the posting and the creation of this content is largely a, a, an individual process. And then, uh, Etsy goes directly to heavyweight collaboration, where he categorizes social machines. But before that, I think we can also add a new category, um, which is the category of open innovation, such as uh, Planet Hunters and Galaxy Zoo, uh, where, in this case, again, uh, the software provides the users the ability to contribute in a variety of ways on the basis of several tools, but again, the creation of the content is largely an individual process. Instead, um, the creation of content is a distributed process only in the case of social machines, such as Wikipedia, and this is what is distinctive about social machines, that the creation of content is a largely social process, a largely collaborative process. So to conclude, um, I don't think that social machines are so common yet. Uh, so it is worth asking how are we going to create them in the future? How are we going to design success on social machines? And I think that in general it is worth paying attention to what epistemology, cognitive science, and more specifically dynamical systems theory is going to say. Because I think that dynamical systems theory is going to be very important towards designing and modeling such social machines in the future. But for the time being, uh, we can pay attention to some general concepts. So I suggest that mutual interactions between the users is going to be, and the machinery is going to be very important, exactly because they allow machines to self-regulate, self-organize, and thereby operate on the basis of some kind of decentralized control that will allow them to be very adaptive uh, to the evolving needs and changes in the environment. And also, I think, even though not strictly necessary, uh, it is also worth paying attention to the properties of common knowledge and differentiated structure, because this is what will allow social machines to be uh, operating efficiently. And finally, also, uh, I want to mention uh, a thought with respect to the ethics of social machines. Paul Smart uh, talked about that as well. Um, which has to do with how are we going to attribute credit or blame whenever things go right or wrong in the case of social machines. Because I don't think that uh, we can go on and divide the credit or blame and then attribute it to specific individuals. Instead, exactly because social machines so, uh, self-organize and self-regulate, um, if we're going to attribute credit or blame, then that will have to be to the overall machine as a whole. Thank you.